Your name is? Uh, Wally Holmes. And, and what's your role in this event? Uh, I'm the festival director of the Sweet and Hot Music Foundation and also the Sweet and Hot Music Festival. And who founded it? Uh, well, we've had a festival here at the Marriott for 25 years. It was under another name for the first 14 of them, and we've had a, fe a uh, festival here for the last 16. That, wait a minute, that's too many years. I th we've, this is our 14th year, yeah, as the Sweet and Hot Music Festival. But it's always been the same kind of music, which is music of the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. And the reason that we started this festival and used the 20s and 30s as one of our bases is because no one was or is playing the 20s and 30s music anymore except people at strictly traditional festivals. But we wanted to include it in music that goes further than that and goes into the 50s like, you know, so, a little bit of straight ahead on the West Coast jazz scene and that kind of thing. Right there, Mike, right. uh, and what does it mean to you, this festival? I mean, what, what, what's, what's your motivation? Well, I do this just for that reason. I mean, uh, years ago, I, when I saw that no one cared about, again, the 20s and 30s music, uh, you know, I wondered why. And I was thinking all the time, hey, why is this music being dissed so much? And I looked at it like this, like with art, for example. When you take uh, someone like uh, Rembrandt, you know, and you discard him for Picasso, and that's exactly what has happened here. I mean, they said, hey, 20s and 30s don't count. It's straight ahead and beyond. And now what's happening, straight ahead is having some trouble, and we're going into classical jazz, which is mostly played in halls and that kind of thing. That's not jazz. The main thing about jazz, as far as I'm concerned, this is just a personal opinion, it has to swing. And when it swings, everybody knows it's swinging. If just the guys on stage know it's swinging and nobody else knows, then it isn't swinging. Because if you remember, well, you don't remember, you're too young. But the 20s, jazz was the hottest thing going. It was the star thing. It was what everybody looked up to. It was the rock and roll of the era. And then after that, we had the swing era and dancing was the star of that. And the guys in the bands, in the big bands, the good looking trumpet player that was you know, playing fourth trumpet, he was the one that all the girls were looking at. Sinatra started there, you know, out of so many stars, Perry Como, so many guys started out of the big bands and such. And uh, for some reason in the United States, we do not respect jazz. It's our only form of art that we created ourselves and we've just let it go. And I don't think any other country in the world lets go of their artistic icons and of their of their artistry. You know, I mean, you know, they polish up all their things every year so that the tourists can see them in the summer. I mean, you're never going to see, you know, the, the Sistine Chapel having any problems being polished and that kind of stuff. And there are ways that we could do this, but the government is going to have to step in. You're kind of young, but in the uh, uh, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, we had our people, jazz people, going all over the world, and they were like jazz ambassadors. And the people had a lot more respect for us then because they loved jazz over in Europe because it's so different. It's like, wow, I've never heard anything like this in my life. I can keep talking because when you think about jazz, it's the only art form that is created on the spot. A guy has to, you know, he practice in the daytime, but when he gets on that stand, he's got to produce art or it's not going to last very long. And it's the only one I know because, you know, like a writer, he can say, well, I'm burned out today and he can quit. He doesn't have to do a particular four hours and a painter can do the same thing. But a guy that's playing jazz, when he hits it at 9 o'clock, he's going to be there at 1.30, and that's just the way it is. And are you a player yourself? I'm a trumpet player, yeah. yeah. And so what's it like as a, as a side man coming in and being, uh, being the impresario for, for so many performers? Well, it's, uh, I've been doing it for so long, it's just part of what I do. But the way, I, the way I'm interested in it is... Uh, I run my festival by letting the musicians do what they want to do. I just hire them. I don't tell them anything. I don't even see them again except when I, I have a president up in the presidential suite, which is up on the 17th floor, which if you want to after this, you can go up there and you can talk to some of them. And, uh, you know, I just, we provide drinks and food up there and they, and they get together, they commiserate. And a lot of them, like a lot of, uh, of L.A. jazz musicians, have started to get international jobs because of that. And that 
that's that's my idea. I'm interested in the guys that create the music. I'm not interested necessarily in big bands or that kind of thing or people that are playing charts and that. I just like the guys that get up and blow their mind, so to speak, which is what the expression was in the old days. You know, blow, that's what it really means. It's a jazz expression. Mean, you know, say what you think. You know, work on, talk to me, that kind of thing. You know. What do you see as the future of this event? Well, the future of this event is part of the future of jazz. And the thing is, I'm, I, you know, I'm 81 years old, and I can tell you that if jazz, if the government doesn't step in, jazz as we know it, the swinging part of it, I think within a decade is going to be in real trouble. Because most of the people that have got it inside of themselves are 70 years or older, you know? Uh, what branch of the government could get involved and what would you like to see them do? Well, well, I've got a couple ideas. I'm going to tell you my one idea, which I think is just absolutely incredible as, from a commercial standpoint that would you know, create interest all over the world. I would like to see, of course, I would like to see the government uh, give a, what I consider a pittance to the, uh, to the art of jazz, which would be $5 billion a year, which is not a lot of money. And the hook that I would like to give it, uh, to see if we could get it going, is I would like the government to create a jazz train that never stops. A jazz train? That never stops. That's the most important thing. So that all over the world, in other words, a band would get on in L.A., they'd play for the people going up to San Francisco, somebody would book them a gig in San Francisco, guys would get on in San Francisco and go to Denver, but it would never stop. It would go on for the rest of time and everything. So that people all over the world, after 10 years or so, would be talking about this jazz train that never stops. And I think that that would be the beginning of the rebirth of jazz and I'll tell you why in the 20s jazz was the major thing everybody was into it and the speakeasies and everything it was the place oh god let's go hear some jazz tonight when I grew up there was either a piano player in every cafe and bar that I went to in San Diego and there was always dance music on the weekends like that and in in the 30s the only thing on the radio and I dig this the only thing on the radio was music, and most of it was live. There was no talk, it was all music, and much of it was live. And that's all gone. You know, it's out the window. So we have to do something else, because we can only be a part of it now. We can't, thank you, we can't, we can't own the whole thing, but we can be a part of it. And I think that, that jazz train idea is a way we could be a part of it, and jazz would continue from that. Because people like 10 years from now say, hey, the jazz train is coming over to Minot, North Dakota, or something like that. You know, let's, let's go here. You know, that kind of a thing. How about Pennsylvania Station? Yeah, yeah, because you, you, you mean the song? Yeah, like that, you know, you know, Pennsylvania 6, 5,000 by, right, right, exactly. by the uh, Glenn Miller yeah, band, you know. Yeah. And those were fun things, too, where the band all sang, Pennsylvania 6, 5,000 at the end of every, you know, phrase. So how do you feel at the end of this this event? What's, what's well, your... I, I feel great. I really do. Because I realize when I... Because, you know, we have a good mixture of people. We're getting a lot more young people that are, that are dancing to the swing thing. And when the music happens, just like it was in the 30s, everybody is on the same page. They all want to hear the music. They all want to dance to it. They all want to be friendly. They want to feel the beat. And so it creates an atmosphere of being of coming together, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. I mean, it's not weird, it's just the way it is. <laughs> hey, these are, these are some of the guys that didn't get paid.